We know now. Sam's behind every crash this entire year. Sam was behind Terra Luna. Sam was behind Celsius. Sam was behind Voyager. Sam was behind Three Arrows Capital. That's the track record of FTX. They are criminals. They've been criminals since the beginning. They've been like the mafia. What I will tell you is Kevin O'Leary was 100% complicit in uh, helping FTX crash Celsius. There's no way Ripple walks out of this, even if there is a small settlement and they pay a small fine. There's no way Ripple out, you know, walks out of this situation without people being like... Hey, welcome back, everybody, to Altcoin Daily. My name's Austin, joined by one of the largest crypto channels on the internet, Ben of BitBoy Crypto. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's been a while since we've done this. I haven't been on the channel in a while. Too long, too long. Too long. And, dude, I feel we got you again at perfect timing. You were early, weeks early in calling the Sam Bankman Freed uh, bad actor nest there. Yeah. T take us through that a little bit. Like, how did how were you able to find out that information first and whistleblow? Yeah. So it's it's just a very interesting, you know, right place, right time. And you know, some, sometimes you got to feel like there's a bigger plan in play. Like maybe I was there for a reason to find this information out. And and when you look back at, at the way everything happened, uh, we have a bill. A lot of people know we have a bill. We had some meetings with it yesterday with some funders that were trying to get all the money raised for it. It's a difficult process, costs a lot of money to do a bill. $3.6 million is how much it costs. It's not, you know, not $2, you know, um, you know, that that's how politics work. And so when we realized what we needed to raise, and it, this creates a mechanism for crypto regulation where crypto has a seat at the table, that's what we want. Uh, we were like, let's reach out to FTX, you know, because FT Sam Bateman Freed had just been on Capitol Hill at that point. And he, he famously like flamed back some of the people that were questioning where they said, well, you know, like, I think people are confused on this change. They don't know what to do. And Sam was like, no, actually, all the people on the site know how to use it. Like, y'all are the ones that don't know how to use it. So be careful what you say about the users. And I was like, yeah, that sounds cool, Sam. Get it, you know? I've never been a person who had fully made up my mind on Sam Bankman Free. If you've watched my channel throughout the years, you would know that for I just, you know, I made fun of his haircut a lot. But it's like, outside of that, I haven't been able to pin down what I think about him. Is he a good actor? Is he a bad actor? It's always seemed like there was a little smoke and mirrors there. I could never put my finger on it. Well, now we all know what it was. And so what happens is we go to FTX for funding for our bill. And uh, we meet where we contact Brett Harrison, the, the CEO, former CEO of FTX US. And he says, yeah, we might actually be interested in this. So send, send over the bill. So we send the bill. He sends it over to former CFTC commissioner, Wet Jen, who is now, um, you know, at the time, he was the head of policy at FTX. He sat on it for three weeks. And that's weird in the world of politics. In the world of politics, is a very fast movie. You got to try to beat everybody to where you're trying to go. You send your bill out, and then you're worried people are going to steal the idea and stuff like that. So uh, what we do is uh, we have our, one of our main political backers. We have, we're have we bipartisan. We have backers on both sides. One of the major ones, a, a, a name that people, especially in your state, would, would know for sure, called Commissioner Wetgen and or former Commissioner Wetgen and said, Hey, what's up with this? Like you're sitting on our bill. Like why? He said, oh yeah, actually we're not going to be funding the bill. We never were. We actually want you to leave working for, you know, for that bill, that bill's direction and come work for us. Cause we're having problems with your side of the aisle. Okay. What are y'all doing? Oh, we're trying to do a federal bit license. <laughs> And nobody believed me. They, I was like boy crying wolf out there saying, guys, they're doing this, they're doing this, they're doing this. No one else had this information. Some people actually had some inklings of the insolvency. No, not one person had the information that we had on this federal bill license. So what happens? What happens is on uh, it took about two weeks between when I got this information the day I got back from Alaska, which was on September 18th, I believe, took me about a week and a half to really slowly pepper it out because I didn't want to just come out and say it overnight. I didn't want to protect our source, you know? And so it was, I think it was a Wednesday when I made a video that was like, this is what they're doing. Sam Bateman Freeze is creating a federal bit license. He wants to go after decentralization. He wants to go after peer to peer transactions. So we put that video out the next day, Brett Harrison steps down as president of FTX. I think he was fired. Ironically, now it's starting to come out that very potentially Brett Harrison might be the one that blew the whistle to CZ on, on everything that uh, was going on uh, that caused them to sell their tokens.
their FTT. So what happens is at that point, we, we get the information. We, we we start telling people Brett Harrison steps down. The next day, Brett Harrison followed me on Twitter, which was funny. And, uh, you know, we're talking about it for weeks. Well, then SBF puts out his famous political manifesto, which was a lot different on Twitter than it was actually on the website. But the thing he says on there that's so interesting is uh, he specifically in the last tweet said, by the way, I love decentralization and DeFi. And we definitely want to protect peer-to-peer transactions because they were watching my videos. They knew I was the person that had this. They were literally making responses to what I was talking about and then trying to minimize me like I wasn't important. Uh, and like, I didn't really have it. Well, something amazing happens at this point. People realize I really did have that information five weeks before anybody else. And so there are so many projects that are just sitting back, waiting in the weeds for someone to rise up that can punch FTX in the mouth because they've been screwing projects since they won. You go look at Reef, Reef put an article out March 15th, 2021, explaining the scam of FTX. And you know what everybody did? Stop fudding FTX. You're you're a you're a project. You're obviously a scam. You're a rug pull. FTX, no, they're the empire. And we were all guilty of thinking that. I was thinking that at the time for sure. When all this came out, I wasn't on Reef's side when they put out that. I was like, Reef people, get out of my chat. That's what I was telling them. Stop shilling Reef in my chat. Meanwhile, they're the ones trying to trying to Blow the whistle on this story. So all of a sudden, all these projects start messaging me. Like some I can't talk about, um, some that I can. ICP obviously did an interview on my channel. New Genesis with New Coin, they did an interview on my channel. Reef did an interview on my channel. Uh, there's several other ones that they did this to. Um, Aptos, they were involved in a, Ap Aptos may not be without blame in this themselves, but they crashed the Aptos launch. Uh, Casper was another project that they crashed the launch. Uh, overinflated the numbers and uh, did some concerning stuff. So all these projects start emailing me all this evidence of what's actually been going on on the FTX exchange. And we started looking at all of it and we started interviewing these people, having meetings, and then just slowly but surely we started putting it all out. Well, we were working with Gretchen Morganson from NBC News on the insolvency story. We were leading to the insolvency when this all came out. When this came out, when when CZ dumped this, we had been working on this story for a week. We wanted to do it in a way that didn't dump the entire market. We didn't want to crash the market. We didn't want to destroy the confidence in crypto. But we were trying to let people know that FTX was insolvent. On October 29th, we released a tweet where he said, you're low IQ if you don't take your money off of FTX. Please, whatever. Take your money off FTX. Close your account or you deserve what's going to happen. Listen to us. We're telling you. And, uh, you know, that's a very famous tweet now that's gone on. You know, they've been sure they showed it on Fox Business. They showed it on CNBC. They showed it on a lot of different places. We were one of the only people that was out there warning because we just, like I said, we happen to be at the right place at the right time. And, um, you know, thousands of accounts and millions of dollars left that exchange uh, because we told people to, to get their money off. Since um, the FTX collapse, we've seen the contagion of that, like branch out huge Genesis, a big OTC desk as well as just the total value locked on Solana just being depleted. What is, are we, is the worst behind us? Like what's the next fallout, do you think? Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, when people are watching this video, uh, I, I think by then we probably will have seen all the fallout. I, I think right now this week, there's still some questions on what might happen. I think over the next week, that'll be answered. Will Genesis file bankruptcy? Like if that happens, uh, then obviously that's going to have a huge effect on everything. And we could be looking maybe at Armageddon. I, I don't know what Armageddon is in crypto, though. I, I still think we go between ten and $12,000 anyways. Um, and I think a lot of this money locked on these exchanges is might be preventing us from going down there right now. I think we're going to get to that ten to $14,000 range specifically. Anyways, maybe slightly below 10K, maybe in the nine somewhere. Uh, but I think that really the massive effect of this is, is pretty much after we see the fallout from Silvergate, Digital Currency Group, Grayscale, Genesis, um, CoinDesk. When we see how all of that shakes out, I think that will be the final piece of this. You know, we predicted the end of the, the bottom of the market all year for the end of November, middle of December, in that range. And here we are. It, it's really just doing exactly what the Bitcoin cycle has always done. So your best guess is somewhere around 9K sometime by the end of this year. That's the 979899. Nine, nine, XX. That's where that's gotcha. where I tend to see it's going to slightly wick below 10k, but it might not. If we don't get the worst case scenario, let's say Genesis is able to get the money, well, we're still going to see a dip. I believe in the next three weeks, 
Um, you know, I don't know exactly what will cause it, but I, st- I think we're going to hit that ten to $14,000 range. If things go the worst possible way and, and things keep going in- insolvent and there's more reverberating effects, then I think we certainly have the ability to get down in the nines. What are you looking into 2023? Like, what do you wish more crypto investors understood in this post FTX world? I wish more crypto investors understood why we're here. <laughs> you know, like not here to get rich overnight. You know, it's, it's not a rich, get rich quick scheme like a lot of people think it is. I, I tell people all the time, it took me nine years to become a millionaire in crypto from the first time I bought Bitcoin. If I understood and I was more educated and I knew what I was putting my money into, that would have been probably, you know, an 80% quicker path. But because I didn't understand necessarily what I was looking at, I wasn't getting educated then, you know, it took me longer than it should have. Well, you know, people in crypto today have to understand, especially in a bear market, you're not getting rich tomorrow. And so while you're here, you know, come for the money and the Lambos, right? You you stay for the ideals and the philosophies. We have to reject stock market 2.0. This has to happen. We have to have some kind of gatekeeping in this community. And I understand that's a very taboo phrase when it comes to, to crypto decentralization, we don't want to keep people out on an individual level. We, we don't want people to uh, not be able to get into crypto because they don't have enough money. We don't want people to stay out of crypto because uh, their state is regulated a different way. We don't want that kind of gatekeeping. But for those of us that work in this industry or in it every day, we need to gatekeep your Sam Bankman frees from getting in here again. We, we need to gatekeep your Kevin O'Leary's from, from getting in. Well, dude, you we you've been to, going you've been going hard on Kevin course. O'Leary this last yeah, week. Yeah, for sure. Why? Yeah, he's a snake. He's a snake. It's very obvious. It's very clear. Like, I'm I'm not gonna get I'm not gonna spend too much time getting into the personal stuff of of uh you know what happened in Muskoka in, in Ontario. People can look that story up. There's a lot of you know strange red flags. The local people will tell you a different story than than anybody else in Canada will tell you about that. There, there's been some bad stuff in his past. Uh, I'm not going to get into the specifics of that. What I will tell you is Kevin O'Leary was 100% complicit in uh, helping FTX crash Celsius. Uh, When you look, when you go back and you look at, because we, look, we, we know now Sam's behind every crash this entire year. Sam was behind Terra Luna. Sam was behind Celsius. Sam was behind Voyager. Sam was behind Three Arrows Capital. Well, people think it went right down to the Three Arrows Capital liquidation and moved right back up. They were big game hunting. Why? Because they were slowly getting more insolvent by the day, and they needed those giant money dumps to try to keep the Ponzi going a little bit further. So when it comes to Celsius, Celsius Celsius certainly has their own. The Celsius team, Alex Mashinsky, they definitely have responsibility. They, they they will. They need to be held accountable, and they, they are being held accountable. They will be held accountable. Um, but Sam caused that. When, when, when you understand the true scam, the true scam of what FTX was doing by counterfeiting coins and inflating them on their markets. And then you understand Sam has a gigantic short in on the sell token. You realize that they were inflating the supply on the exchange the entire time in order to begin to, to tank Celsius. Kevin O'Leary, right at this exact same time, who we know is friends with Sam, who has defended Sam to the gills, even though 94% of people, on according to my Twitter poll, believe Kevin's take on Sam is wrong, right? That, that, oh, he's a good guy. Nobody thinks that, okay? Despite all that, Kevin's company also, WonderFi, one of the wor- one of the last companies to pump money over to Sam, we know that they're thick as thieves. Does nobody else think it's weird that in June, right before everything started happening with Celsius, Kevin O'Leary is on Coindesk saying, well, you know, I think before we have a change in the market, we're going to have to see Celsius go to zero. What? Where did that come from? It's an FTX competitor. They were orchestrating it from the inside out. That's been the plan. They've. If you look at the track record of FTX, who do they go after? Competitors of Solana, competitors of FTX. Those are the two types of coins. Everything they, they've gone after and they've tried to destroy, it fits within one of those two buckets. Say, dude, saying... Mr. Wonderful's complicit. It's like, are you worried about getting sued? By the way, altcoin no, daily. No, no, no. He can't. He, he can't sue me because he's guilty. And so, if he defames, if he but you have hard proof. Do you have hard proof? Oh yeah, oh yeah. If he accuses me of defamation, it goes to discovery, and he loses. He won't go discovery. That's why he won't come after me. Kevin O'Leary is not a person that sues. He's a person that settles. So 
if you look at the lawsuits that have been filed against him and even criminal criminal cases against him, he pays people off. That's what he does. He, he, he doesn't want anything to go to discovery. He knows, and this is what this is why Sam, Sam Bankman Freed, very similar. They, they all use the same. And look at the comparison between FTX and Kevin O'Leary. Look at the fact that FTX, centralized exchange, Super Bowl commercial, uses athletes to promote. Kevin O'Leary, bit by Canadian exchange, use the same model. Super Bowl commercial, uh, Kyle Lowry from the Toronto Raptors. It's the same scam. They've been they were running the same scam in two different countries. They're thick as thieves. When you look at the money ties between WonderFi and between Alameda and between FTX, it suddenly starts to make sense what's going on there. In 2020, Sam hacked his own project, Cover Protocol. Supposedly for $100 million, you look up the numbers, you'll see about $10 million floating around, somewhere in the $10 million range. There's a sworn testimony out there that says it was $100 million that Sam himself took, fled to Hong Kong. Why? Because there was a lawsuit in 2019 filed against, against Carrie Wang, Caroline, Sam. I think Dan, those three for sure. I think Sam Trabaco may have been named on it as well. It was getting close to discovery. He had to flee the country. Why? In discovery, all this stuff comes out. There's a coin, SAMO coin, S-A-M-O. This is the coin the FTX has used as a slush fund. He got up to $600 million in market cap, a meme coin that they ran, that they literally used to pay settlements and pay lawyers and pay individuals behind closed doors. One guy, Dave Mastriani, uh, this guy attempted to sue FTX, and FTX said, well, we tell you what, because he lost $10,000. The, the coin that he was in, Cover Protocol, went up to 100, uh, where he made like three or 400 k He couldn't withdraw it. There was no liquidity, and he kept trying to withdraw it, and they wouldn't let him, and then the price crash ended up losing his original $10,000. So he, he was suing them for that amount. Well, Dan Freeberg and, and, and uh, Sam came to him and said, Okay, we don't want to talk to you about this lawsuit. We want to talk to you about your new job at FTX. What do you mean my new job at FTX? Well, we want you, this is, this is all documented, emails, verified, fact-checked by NBC News. None of this is hypothetical, okay? Well, Dave, we, we want to talk about your new job at FTX. Well, what about my lawsuit? No... We're here to talk about your new job at FTX. You sign a contract, and we're going to pay you one Bitcoin for 30 days of advising us with NFT projects. Dave's like, okay. Now, if you go back to when this was, Bitcoin would have been between fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 at this point, right? So he's thinking, okay, I put $10,000 in. I lost it. I didn't get my money out. But now I'm at least going to get you know money coming in. They don't ever give him anything to do. He sits, he goes up their office. He's like, what am I supposed to be doing? My, let me rephrase that. I don't know if he went to their office. It might have been remote. I'm not sure. But it's like, what? why are we doing this? The contract itself, which once again, fact-checked by NBC News, the contract specifically had language letting FTX out of the liability from the cover protocol hack and liquidity scam, which Andre Cronier promoted as well. SBF and Andre Cronier promoted this. That was all they wanted. He didn't do anything. He didn't do anything at all the entire time he was there. All he did was collect one Bitcoin and sign away his rights to be able to sue them. That's the track record of FTX. They are criminals. They've been criminals since the beginning. They've been like the mafia. You look over what Kevin O'Leary, Kevin O'Leary's been doing the same stuff. He's been doing the exact same. Why do you think he says, well, nine out of 10 people, you know, I know. So tell you, Sam's a great guy. Who thinks that? Who thinks that someone that literally stole customer funds, literally stole customer funds under the pretense of we're just letting you hold your money here, be like your bank taking your deposits completely and just gamble them in a casino. It's it's totally whack. Kevin knows this stuff will come out. So sure, Kevin, if you, I tell you what, Kevin, you, you want to come after me for defamation? Come after me, bro. I I have the evidence. We'll put it all out. Dude, first off, I want to say to the audience watching at home or whoever watching at home, 
all from all alleged altcoin daily. I mean, some of this stuff is very obvious and I can substantiate some of the stuff you're saying, some of these hardcore claims alleged, we still have to double check these, some of them, but obviously that's honestly, that's why I subscribe to you because often you have a lot of this insight, especially in the regulatory side. And speaking of that, dude, is the crypto market screwed now from a regulatory standpoint? No, absolutely not. Post FTX. I, I, that's that, that, that's the narrative that people want to put out. First and foremost, we're getting no regulation until January, February at the very earliest. Probably this crypto regulation is coming in the middle of next year. So everybody's freaking out. You know, these people pushing these articles. And look, we're in the YouTube business. We understand clickbait. Like We understand it, right? Actually, you you and Aaron taught me clickbait. I just want to be clear on that. You can't I hate learned, the player, hate the game. I learned from Mr. I, Beast. 100, 100%. I learned, I learned everything about clickbait from you guys. You guys helped me out. So the monster I have become... Is because of you, uh, you know. Th thank you for that. Everybody uh, uses it on YouTube, so you're welcome. They do, they do. It's the it, look when YouTube starts judging content of uh, quality of content, we will all go away from it. But it is what it is. You have guess what? what? Traditional media has been doing clickbait since the beginning of newspapers, or even before that. So when you look at uh, these articles that were coming out from some of these new publications, what they were saying is. Congress still trying to push through SBF regulation. That's not true. That's not what they're doing. That totally misrepresenting what was happening. The DCCPA still probably going to go through it. We're I'm actually counting on it going through. We're, what is we're hoping our bill goes in as amendment on that. DC. But, how do I say it? It's the DC. No, what is that? Right? Oh, it's it's the John Boozman bill. It's oh, what okay. it, yes. it's the you know one of the main things is to create uh, and of course uh, stab now or stab now however you pronounce her name. Uh, it will be to push Ethereum and Bitcoin officially as commodities, so the SEC mm -hmm. can't go back and be like, oh, now because they got some nodes in America, you know, now we can you know call Ethereum a security, blah 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 blah, dirty Gary Gensler. So the the whole idea is that that's not true, like. The SPF regulation, wherever whatever language he helped them to shape, that's toxic. They want to run as far away from that as possible. The bill is still going to go through. It's not in its final form yet. Plenty of language is still going to be tweaked in on that. The, and we're hoping that our bill, which our bill, the idea of our bill, like, once again, I wish I could just tell everybody what it is, but I can't because we're still trying to get it registered and funded. It's very expensive to get this stuff done. And, of course, it's bottom of the bear market, right? Like, Genesis can't even get a billion dollars to save crypto. Like, you know, we're having a hard time getting 3.6 million. So the, the whole thing is our bill creates a mechanism with crypto people at the table to play a heavy role in creating smart regulation along with uh, other regulators and other experts. And, and so when people find out what it is, they're going to be like, oh my gosh, that's such a great idea. We love that. Um, but we're hoping to sneak that into, into as we also have a route as an executive order, by the way. So if, if this route doesn't work, we also have another route still. We, we, we do have an end with the president. I don't know the president, but we have an end with the president Biden, where we could get. Yeah. Yeah. He is a president still, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just making sure. I think. Yeah. Yes. I think he is, or maybe his wife. I, I don't know who the president is, but <laughs> the whole thing is Bowls. we, <laughs> we do have some. We do have some routes um, to, to get in there as well. Um, but but I think what, what's important is if our crypto regulation goes through, which once again, it's a mechanism. I'm not shaping crypto laws. We're giving the way the laws should be formed with people smarter and more involved. Well, it'd be hard to be smarter. I'm in mental, you know, <laughs> but I'm just kidding. That was, I, I am, but that's a joke. <laughs> the, the, the whole idea is, you know, with people that are more plugged into the regulation side, uh, like, People that someone that runs maybe an exchange might be a, a good person. Now, wouldn't be Sam Bankman free, doesn't need to be Brian Armstrong. I don't know. Maybe Jesse Powell. Is he Canadian? Maybe I don't know if he's Canadian or not. But someone like Jesse Powell would be someone who we would want. Somebody like Eric Voorhees would be somebody we would want to help shape those. So choosing the right people to help shape those laws, that's what that's what we're doing. And we think it's the only way. We think if our bill doesn't go through, it is very scary where this is going to go. Um, because there's no safeguards. Does this post FTX world affect the XR, the Ripple SEC versus the Ripple lawsuit at all? Okay, so number one, FTX International did have Ripple listed or XRP, excuse me, did I have XRP li uh, listed um, as funds they hold as a tradable asset on the platform? Oh, oh, oh it right, did. Right. 
yes. when it was still a thing, you know, FTX US, I don't know if it, I don't think it did have XRP on there. I'm not hundred percent sure, but the, the whole idea is where does this fit in? Well, I think this is a really, here's the beautiful thing about this. Okay. I think it is going to affect XRP in a big way when it comes to the case, because the case that we're going to make for my bill that is going to line up very well with this FTX situation is that Gary Gensler's got to go. We're taking the power away from Gary Gensler. Like, if you think the SEC is in charge of crypto now, after our bill goes through, that he won't be. They will not be. Gary Gensler is the most negligent person in this entire space. If you lost money on FTX, Celsius, or Voyager, it's because of Gary Gensler. Because he hasn't done his job to create clarity or, or to create any type of infrastructure to make crypto companies want to operate onshore here in the United States instead of in shell companies around the world. So who really got the fire started against Gary Gensler? Well, that's the entire XRP army is they've discovered so many, so many uh, things that he's done that have been wrong. We already know we can't trust him. So now I want you to think about this, Austin. We have an entire space that has a lot of dodgy characters and the number one person right now in charge of regulating and enforcing in this space, literally no one trusts him. So people say, you've got all this evidence, which by the time this video is out, by the way, also uh, we will have evidence on our website published. We're, we're actually doing that today and tomorrow so people can go and cross-check a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. We don't just talk. We've got the evidence. Now, we can't release everything because there is a process to this, but when people see all this that we have, it's going to be you know pretty pretty uh, uh, pretty damning here. No one trusts Gary Gensler. You think I'm going to go take all the evidence I have on FTX and give it to Gary, who's been meeting with SBF for six months? No, no, no one will. So here's the beautiful thing: Gary Gensler is going to be out soon. It's not going to be long now. I I actually I, I've gone back and forth whether it's going to be January or June. If things work out in the next four weeks, like I think that they're going to. He will probably be out by January. If not, when the Republicans come in in the House and they're in charge of the Reform and Oversight Committee, if you didn't know this is the most powerful committee in all of Washington, they're going right at Gary Kinsler. They're going to go right at him. He literally met with SBF multiple times, including supposedly, uh, uh, supposedly did a quick little investigation and found nothing wrong with FTX at some point. Hmm. Hmm. it's weird it's weird what happens when your girlfriend's dad is the head regulator's boss at mit it's almost like there's a conflict of interest there and you're getting into so many conflicts of interest between william henman gary ginsler uh gregory ellison like it really starts to paint a picture of absolute corruption inside the walls of the sec and we all know it's been going just thank god it's finally becoming public what is the most likely outcome for Ripple versus the SEC? And what's that mean for XRP? I said, let me guess, let me, based on what you just said, until Gary Gensler retires, expect nothing. But you think that's- Gets kicked out. Gets kicked out, exactly. Uh, but so based on either of those two outcomes, what what happens to Ripple versus the SEC? So, so there is a short-term outcome here where if Gary Gensler were to get removed in January, let's say our bill were to go through in March- the SEC has no power. That case is probably over. Okay. If our bill gets passed, there's a large chance that the case just ends um, because there won't be anything for them to go after. The control will be pulled away. You know, we will be kneecapping the SEC's ability to do their job, which they haven't done for years and years and years anyway. So it's not like it's that important. So to me, I don't expect, but the most likely scenario, I still think the, I think our bill goes through in June. And I think Gary Gensler's already gone by then. Unless somebody comes in after Gary Gensler and drops the case, we've also been looking for the case to end around quarter two of next year, the end of quarter two, maybe beginning of quarter three, maybe over the summer. So you start looking at these timelines, you look forward and say, okay, well, the most likely situation is whether it's our bill that does it or whether the case ends. Um, I do believe Ripple wins or gets the most favorable settlement you've ever seen in your life. There's no way Ripple walks out of this, even if there is a small settlement and they pay a small fine, there's no way Ripple out, you know, walks out of this situation without people being like, oh, they laid the smack down on the SEC. Everybody's going to know that. I do expect it to be the middle of next year, 
but we're not going to get gigantic price action from anything in the next seven months other than maybe one more dramatic dump. Guys, next year's accumulation for everything. So if you're in the XRP army, the reality is the longer this extends into next year, the better. And the reason is because of the momentum that you will catch. If the case were to basically end today, there will be certainly a large short-term pump, probably go up two, three X. It'll come back down. Where the price is today, it'll probably go over a dollar, maybe a dollar fifty, maybe four X, whatever it is. It's going to tick back down over the next few months and not be at much further of a starting position uh, for the next bull run than it is right now. It would be, it would probably stay at least, I think, two X from where it is now. I don't think it would go back below 50 cents once the case ends, unless the whole market tanks and we're in multi year bear market, which a lot. Some people think that crypto savvy thinks that. We don't think that. It's the most bearish people out there do. Uh, but the, the longer this goes into next year, the better off. Because let's say let's say it ends in Ju the end of July next year. Well, the halving's in March. And, and based off of the last cycle, we were both you know, around for and in, in, in the, ba the business every single day during that time. You know, after the halving, you or leading into the halving, you do get a pump leading into it. A large one right before it happens. But last time it was thrown off because of the pandemic. So we had risen up to $10,000 at the end of January and February of 2020, uh, 20, uh, of 2020. And then we got the pandemic news start slowly spring through February and March 12th when the market crashed of 2020, dramatic pullback all the way down to 3,900. I think the price would have stayed around $10,000 uh, all the way through the halving and then may have had a little bit more momentum. So, so the point is, if that was in January, and we're saying that this having is going to be two months earlier, then by November, October, November of next year, we should start seeing some things tick up. So we'll be close enough to positive momentum and heading into the bull run that XRP will hold its gains a lot better. And the whole thing is it was suppressed in the last bull run. Guys, the liquidity that's going to be available for, for XRP once it goes listed again on all the exchanges, once Coinbase, right now people don't even know where to buy it. People in crypto don't even know where to buy it. Go to KuCoin. People know go to KuCoin, right? But who knows about KuCoin? Like you got to be in this business every day to pretty much know about KuCoin or at least be pretty involved. I guarantee you, I go ask nine out of 10 people to own Bitcoin. They're not going to know what KuCoin is, right? So um, I think that's the whole thing is we're really looking for the upside of, uh, you know, the liquidity from getting relisted on exchanges. And so the, the later in the year, the better, in my opinion. And this one, this question is just for fun. Don't get ultra specific because nobody knows the future. But if Bitcoin can clear 100K in the next bull run, what's a prediction you would have for XRP? Well, I do expect Bitcoin to clear 100K. If you use diminishing, diminishing returns theory and it continues, then I think we would be looking at about $100,000 to $120,000 Bitcoin at the top. I tend to believe we're going to get the reversal of diminishing returns and we'll get closer to one hundred and fifty to $200,000 Bitcoin. Um, you know, at least a reversal of such depressed diminishing returns. Last morning, we had 3.5x. So if you were to say, what's 3.5x from 70,000? We've got to hit uh, two, $240,000, I believe. $250,000, 240 to 250 in order to completely reverse diminishing returns and get higher returns for this market. So it'd be $245,000 exactly would be where we should go if we can re revert uh, away from diminished returns. Now, if we revert away from the progression of the percentage, then pretty much anything above 120 k we would consider to be great. Okay. Now, as far as XRP goes, if Bitcoin goes into that 100 to 120 k range with the suppression of the bull run gone, I think XRP will basically... It's going to sound really crazy. I think XRP will replace meme tokens in the next cycle. And what I mean by that is that's where all the money flowed in, right? That's what really kind of hurt our bull run was the money flowing into Shiba and the money flowing into Doge. XRP's got such a viral community. And with that case over and tons of people wanting to jump in the markets and something speculative, I think in the next run, there's a strong chance a ton of that new money comes into XRP. Um, I definitely think, um, I mean, look, the last run, it got up to $2. It didn't get a new all-time high. The all-time high, I believe, is around 320 or so. Um, look, I'm not in this game of guaranteeing things anymore. I used to think I definitely knew where things were going. 
I think it's reasonable to expect, uh, you know, an eight to ten dollar XRP bullish, twelve to fifteen dollars if things go super awesome for it. They form an IPO at the peak of the market like Coinbase did, and maybe it goes even a little bit higher. But we're really looking at that eight to ten dollar range as something that's very realistic. And I want to remind the audience that's half a phone of crypto, guessing where Absolutely. the prices are going. Mm -hmm. We all do it. So I love you. You're so in tune with the XRP law student community. I did want to pick your brain on that. But anyway, Ben, uh, links for all your stuff are down below. I know you have a book coming out. Yeah, really. If I talk about my book for like just one second, like yeah. this is something we're really excited about. The book's called Catching Up to Crypto. Uh, basically, if you haven't been in the market since 2012, like I have, and you wish you had all that information that gives me a unique perspective and gives those of us that have been in this market for a long time unique perspective, you're going to be able to catch up. You're going to read this book. You're going to learn the basics of crypto. You're going to learn the basics of blockchain. You're going to learn where things are at today, where things we think are going in the future. But you're going to get a lot of historical perspective on why things have developed the way they have. What we found, I'm sure you've seen this, uh, Austin, is that when you have an, a new person that comes into crypto on your channel, there's a gap between showing up for the first time and watching a crypto video and being able to understand it, even if it's explained very simply. This book fills that gap uh, for people to where the name of the book, Catching Up to Crypto, once you read it, you're caught up, and now you can watch crypto videos and take in crypto media and really be at a good place to understand what it's talking about. And we're doing a book tour as well. We are uh, coming out to uh, California uh, last week of January. We're doing 14 ooh, cities. Ooh. Boop, boop. And Altcoin Daily, we have like a little, we wrote some, a little blurb on the back or something, right? Oh, that's Very right. Yeah you, yeah, you guys did acknowledgement for the book. Appreciate yep. that. Yep, dude, absolutely. Can't wait to read it. Uh, we just did a blurb about you and the, and the channel and everything. But um, Ben, dude, links for your stuff down below. I'll let you go. Doing anything fun this weekend? <laughs> I think by the time people are watching this video, people are going to have a good idea of uh, what I'm doing. I'm going big game hunting this weekend. I guess that's uh, uh, going, uh, and by big game, it might be a big haircut. We'll see. <laughs>